Hello, my name is Jerron Vale from the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. Our equity project began a little over a year ago with a vision for addressing inequities and educational disparities for Missouri citizens. The department's desire is to build a careful process for addressing inequities and show our commitment toward equitable outcomes for all Missourians aligned with our vision to empower every Missourian with the skills and education needed for success. The Building Bridges series is an informative look at how Missouri's colleges, universities, and community organizations are addressing equity. We hope you learn from these shared experiences, and thank you again for joining us. Welcome everyone, I'm Angie Bessendorfer. I'm the Chancellor of WGU Missouri, and we're excited to be here to share some information on understanding equity across the student experience. Um, this is a, a lot of information that we'll, we'll talk through, which is part of a grant program that um, WGU Labs has received. And so I'm going to begin just really quickly with a little bit of WGU 101 about WGU Missouri. And so first, Western Governors University is a private nonprofit university that serves nationwide that is completely online and uses a competency-based model for learning. And so we do things very differently than the traditional university. About eight years ago now, WGU Missouri was founded by our governor, Jay Nixon, and we now have 3,200 students. And what I want you to know about our students is that we really are focusing on underserved students. 70% of our students are considered underserved, either as first generation college students, which is at 40%, or 26% low income, and 12% of our students are students of color and then 25% rural. Um, in addition to that, our student body is primarily adults. The average age student in Missouri is 35, which is the same nationally. And we have 76% of our students who work full-time while they attend school full-time. Because at WGU, all students are degree-seeking students and they all work full-time. They buy six months of education at a time and it's all you can learn and as fast as you can graduate. So you can start on the first day of any month and graduate any day of the year, but it's designed to really fit into the cracks and crevices of life. Um, going to the next slide, you'll be able to see that WGU's enrollment in Missouri is about 40% in the College of Business, 19% the College of Health, the Teachers College is 25% of our student body, and then the College of Information and Technology is 16%. Um, we now have almost 5,000 graduates in the state of Missouri. And so we continue to grow those numbers and, and to do the kinds of things that are helping people um, to change their lives. But one of our big focuses has really been on serving the underserved and really reaching more students who are in those categories. And so we've been working on this for a number of years in WGU Missouri, and it's now a national in initiative for the university overall. What I wanna tell you really quickly is that in Missouri, we've been focusing on increasing our student body with the students of color. And so in, since 2018, we've increased the students of color by 25%. While our, our student body of white students has only increased 8%. On the alumni side, we've increased 98% um, um, for people of color versus 53% for our white graduates. The other thing that I'm really proud of is the graduation rate for our students of color. It's not where we want it to be, but it has improved by eight percentage points. It's currently 39% for students of color compared to 45% for our white students. But the graduation rate for, for students of color increased eight percentage points since 2018. And we believe that that's really significant. We're really trying to continue to, to support students and provide those wraparound services that really matter. At this point, I'm going to transition to um, share with you the opportunity that, that we can learn from Jason Levin. Um, Dr. Levin is with WGU Labs, and I'm gonna let him tell you all about the great work that WGU Labs is doing. WGU Labs is an entity of the Western Governors University Corporation, um, but it sits outside the university so that it can serve a variety of different needs in helping to push the envelope on higher ed. So Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Angie. Hi, I'm Jason Levin. I'm the executive director of WGU Labs. Um, I'm a longtime employee at WGU. I've been in the system for nine years at this point. Um, most of the time I was the vice president of institutional research. 
Um, but about three years ago, um, I stepped away from that role to start up WG Labs, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of WG. We are a um, ed tech R&D lab. Um, so we do um, research and innovative technologies and processes to that align with WGU's mission, but are not necessarily always done at WGU or WG students. Um, last year, we were funded by the Gates Foundation to study as a planning grant to study the equity gap at WGU. Um, as a research organization that focuses on the student first, we always wanted to keep the voice of the student very close to the research project. Um, this is a quote from an actual quote from one of our students um, that was indicative of a lot of things we heard uh, that we used as kind of a, a guiding light for this project. And that's that um, minority students were actually not only working for themselves, but working for a bigger whole to uh, change perceptions and upset the statistics. I'm very proud to work at WGU. Um, I believe it's the most student-centered university in the country. Um, the first president, Bob Mendenhall, used to tell me that traditional higher ed was built for faculty and for-profit ed was built for shareholders, but WGU was built for the students first and foremost. And um, we can see that realized over time with an army of people, employees of WGU, faculty and staff um, working to continually improve student outcomes. Um, but despite all that hard work, and despite the fact that we've made significant strides in graduation rates across all the demographics, the equity gap still persists. And that's what we aim to study with this project and to see what we might be able to do differently to correct for that. The project was divided into two phases, which are basically now complete. The first phase was a discovery phase where we used mixed method research to understand all of the data we had, speak to students, staff, faculty, administrators, um, and then really synthesize all of that information into some insights. And then phase two, which just completed, was a planning phase where we um, continue to engage student and staff and try to use the insights we gained in the discovery phase to think about what might we do differently in the future. As a researcher, a quantitative researcher by trade, um, in the last you know five years or so, I've been increasingly um, aware of the value of qualitative research and the interaction between qualitative and quantitative research. So we tried to keep a tight loop between secondary data analysis and um, making sure that we could put that in context with the voice of the student, the voice of the faculty, the voice of the alumni. So this is a, a process flow of how we did that for this project. I'm gonna share with you some of the data that we got out of the um, discovery phase. The, the first thing we noticed is, right, is when we laid ethnicity against a student success outcome variable, in this case, it's 24 months retention, and any covariate that we think might be important, income levels, math readiness, um, prior school success or failure, um, we saw this trend where white students outperform black students, outperform, outperform Hispanic students, outperform black students. And no matter what student success variable we looked at, no matter what covariate we lined it up against, this pattern was pervasive across colleges, across courses, um, and in the aggregate. When I looked at that data with my data scientist hat on, I would think that then ethnicity must be a large causal variable, like it would pick up in a statistical model and show huge importance. Um, but when we tested that hypothesis, it wasn't true. Um, you can see that ethnicity was really did not add a lot of additional accuracy to the model. Um, and so what was really happening is that ethnicity was interacting with all these other variables because race is such a powerful construct in America and it colors so many things about um, how the world interacts with you, how you interact with the world, the type of opportunities you've had from a young age that it's realized across all these other variables, um, whether it's you know cognitive scores and reading and math or um, 
the EFC or expected family contribution, uh, which is the Department of Education's wealth index, um, prior academic success, income. And so it's, it's really realized through all those other variables. Um, to demonstrate that a little further, we did a statistical method called the commonality analysis to try to understand how ethnicity was interacting with the various variables. It's not a correlation, but it's where there's overlap, meaning that being a minority and something else creates um, extra variance in the model. So you can see that um, while there's a lot, the circle for being a Black African American student is pretty large, what's unique only to Black or African American students is actually pre pretty small relative to all of these. Another one of our findings that was a little bit, I wouldn't say it's counterintuitive um, given the first quote, but unexpected, at least given the current literature, is that um, minority students had stronger non-cognitive or psychological um, mindsets and skills um, related to learning. So when we use standard measures like uh, Carol Dweck's mindset, Angela Duckworth's grit scale, or some of the more popular self-regulated learning scales, um, minority students consistently scored on average higher than white students. Um, and so what that meant is while th they tended to be less academically prepared, they were actually had more tenacity and grit and even ability to plan and regulate their own learning um, than white students. And we actually were able to um, verify to some extent that those findings in empirical data we collect on our, on our learning platform. And so when we measure um, how much effort minority students put into courses, um, it was consistently higher um, than their white peers. And so you can see this is a histogram of um, how many study days students performed in a particular course. And this distribution is pretty common. It's tightly overlapping, but you can see minority students, it is shifted to the right, are on average working harder than white students. And so like mindset and grit and self regulated learning would predict that it was in fact true. Um, but what that means is they were working harder for every past grade and they were also working harder for every failed grade. So when we synthesized all this data, we came up with three high level insights that um, drove the second half of this study. The first one is that race and identity play a significant yet complicated role in student outcomes. Um, another data point that um, was related to that is our minority students would often tell us that their ethnicity is an important part of their identity, where white students wouldn't say that necessarily. The second insight is that um, students came in with um, higher levels of learning skills, but lower math and reading scores and are taking longer to pass their courses. And so this is something that we wanted to um, test some hypotheses on in the second part of our study. The third insight, which I think is um, has policy implications at WGU and maybe more broadly, is that optimizing for the whole can inadvertently overlook the cost and benefits to minority populations. And so just like the first graph of graduation rates where we can show they're rising over time, you know, op if you optimize to the whole, you're optimizing to the median, which WGU is a white student. Um, and we found some evidence of things that we stopped doing that were benefiting minority students and things that we started to do that harm minority students. But when you looked at aggregate, they all had positive ag aggregate outcomes. Uh, so when we completed our initial discovery, um, we started the planning part of the grant. Um, one thing we wanted to do is to collaborate with students in a co-design sessions. And so we um, created an activity, which I'll show you and invited minority students to participate. We actually got over hundred students to participate in that. Um, one of the positive things about the current um, geopolitical environment in America is that there's a lot of momentum behind equity initiatives. Uh, which I think is really positive for the future. And, and so there was a lot of grassroots activity all across WGU. Um, so we went and took an inventory of everything that was going on at WGU to see if we could um, synthesize, reduce overlap, help create more of a cohesive strategy around. 
And we collaborated with all sorts of folks um, in leadership and diversity and inclusion offices across WGU. Um, so here's our co-design sessions. Um, I actually spoke to one of the researchers who performed these. Um, we had 111 students participate with four students per session. Uh, we hired an external uh, facilitator, Dr. Osohai, um, from the University of Pittsburgh, who is really uniquely qualified to do that. Um, and one of the things the researcher told me to make sure to mention is that they started the sessions out by empowering the students. So they made sure to let the students know that this is your opportunity to influence the practice and strategy of this university. And they felt that that was really important to getting honest and active sessions going forward. The core activity was this creative matrix um, where we would have um, attributes of their education they could select from, like um, your course experience, your experience with your program mentor, your experience with financial aid, um, and they would put those along the uh, Y axis. And then they would go across the top axis where we had different um, archetypes of students or different demographic profi profiles that they either um, identified with or um, had empathy for. And they would then um, sketch their ideas in the in the center grid there of what might we do differently. Um, so that created a, a rich set of data. Uh, we have a, a, a really nice comprehensive report out of that. But that drove um, three other what I'll call tenants to guide like our insights to guide the rest of our planning uh, session. And that was. Um, there is a need for interpersonal connection. And this is actually uh, interesting because when you talk to our white students at WGU, because it's online and self-paced in general, and these are averages, everyone is certainly not the average, they would prefer not to interact with other students. They want to um, put their heads down, power through their courses, um, complete their courses quickly and economically efficiently and get to their um, next career opportunity. Whereas minority students were much more likely to say that there was a need to connect and create a sense of community, um, a social and, and learning experience. Um, WGU is incredibly flexible, um, but there were a lot of recommendations on how to even increase flexibility further. Um, you know, things like if childcare is expensive and everyone's home for the pandemic, taking an online proctor exam can be very difficult especially when the proctor is stopping the test if they hear noise from outside the room because they obviously want to prevent cheating but if it's kids screaming um, that can make it very difficult to, to move forward so we had a number of policy recommendations um, based on uh, that information and the other was increased personalization um, wg does a little bit have a one-size-fits-all instructional model which works very very well for a lot of students, we have you know 200 plus thousand alumni, 125,000 students, um, but it does miss around the edges of students who, who might need more uh, direct teaching support, or direct academic support. Um, one of the recommendations is an equity first learning initiative. Um, I'll show you data in just a second, but the equity gaps in course pass rates are pervasive, but they're highly variable. Um, and so some of the uh, can, some of the recommendations that came out of the co-design sessions were greater peer engagement, active teaching for course instructor, instructors, and more performance-based assessments um, to replace some of the high-stakes objective assessments. One of the data sets that I found really interesting was this one right here. Um, so the equity gap can be plotted as a function of the pass rate. So the more difficult the course is, the higher the equity, excuse me, the equity gap is supposed to be, is expected to be and is. Um, but there's a lot of variability around that. And so we're engaged in studying, taking student recommendations, but also studying um, uh, qualitative attributes of these courses. Like why, for example, is the business of IT application course um, have almost no disparity, while of course with effectively the same pass rate, intro to geography has uh, a pretty significant uh, disparity of 35%. Um, 
So these are things I think we can um, systematically start moving courses above the line to below the line um, to close the equity gap at the course level. Um, another issue is equitable curriculum. Um, you know, we came across a number of complaints about um, things that were culturally insensitive in course materials. Um, and the WGU process for reviewing and amending them was slow and clunky. And it's not because the faculty didn't want to. Um, it's a little bit related to the nature of we have separate, we've disaggregated the role of faculty. So some people build courses, some people teach courses. And I don't think we've set up the, the tightest loops on, you know, correcting things very quickly when they're a, 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 a sensitive nature like this. And so the, because of that, I think some of the teaching faculty were a little bit frustrated that they couldn't influence them. And that was creating maybe curt messages back to students, which was creating um, unintended animosity. One idea we have is creating an equity-based rubric for courses that's something we'd like to build out and potentially make available to the greater community. Another recommendation we're calling Study Supporter 2.0. Um, we're calling it Study Supporter 2.0 because we actually ran a study supporter experiment a number of years ago. Um, we did a randomized controlled trial on WG students um, with a researcher, Todd Rogers, from uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. And um, when we looked at the results in aggregate, they were null, and we discontinued the program. But for this project, when we uh, disaggregated the results by um, by ethnicity, we found that there were statistically significant and, and large effects for Black and African American students, and that was aligned with what we were hearing from the students themselves for uh, the need for greater community. And so, you know, we want to be able to re reinstate this program, but also think about how we might make it more robust and larger and even more effective. Um, another social support uh, recommendation is identity-based communities. Um, so I think it's important, you know, WGU students don't really see each other. And I think a lot of different students feel like there aren't a lot of other students like them there. Students will, I've heard students say things like, oh, I'm, I'm too old. It's like, no, you're not. The average student's 35. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of students in your age demographic. And I think that it's especially true for minority students where, um, you know, there's tens of thousands of every type of student at WGU. We identify a need to enhance our English as a second language support services at WGU. Um, so we're recommending to establish a centralized center um, with trained instructors. Um, so this was, um, you know, I guess I shouldn't be surprised um, given, you know, the growth in WGU and places like Texas and other largely Hispanic populations, but we definitely um, are a critical mass there where uh, we do need to take action. Another recommendation is to create a faculty development center. Uh, minority students in particular need more uh, high quality personalized teaching interactions. Um, the research suggests that they um, have a positive impact on active learning type pedagogy, learn by doing. Uh, and we know that they're coming in with lower levels of academic readiness. There are also some subtle training needs that were happening where the faculty at WGU are incredibly mission driven and they wanna help every student, um, but they were a little bit uncomfortable talking about equity issues and they don't see their students face to face. And so they tend to take an attitude of colorblindness. Um, whereas, um, you know, minimally we're ignoring what is an important part of people's identity and potentially um, creating a situation where it's uncomfortable for students of color to interact with our faculty. Our faculty are actually as diverse as our students, but because we're not walking around campus, the student only sees the fa particular faculty they interact with, um, which may or may not be diverse representation. Um, and the last recommendation is one that I think WG is uniquely set up to take advantage of and is already taking significant action against, and that's um, creating programs of accountability. Um, and so our president has boldly stated as a key performance indicator that 
you know, Angie and I and everyone else are accountable is that we need to increase access to grow our minority populations at twice the rate of um, white students. And we also need to increase the success, the graduation rates and all the other success measures at twice the rate. And because WGU has a corporate governance structure, um, you know, that the accountability for that will just um, titrate throughout the organization. So each program needs an owner. Um, we need to uh, share the data on what the outcomes are across the different minority um, populations and people need will be held accountable to it. So thanks for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Um, feel free to reach out to me or Angie if you have any further questions.